Tom, would you like to come up and introduce tonight's guest speaker, please? Well, as you can clearly see, our guest speaker is Dr. Joseph E. Kelly, professor of, at the School of Earth and Climate Science at the University of Maine. And I, um, you know, as everyone does these days when you want to find someone's background, I Googled uh, Dr. Kelly and fascinating um, interests that he has in that he is interest, he's a geologist who is interested in the scientific research problems that have societal implications. And, you know, I remember I didn't really get past introductory biology back in college, and I started to uh, think about that. And when you, when you see the thing that he's talking about, sea level rise and climate change and all that, and you think about how old this planet is and how much change has occurred, geology is really a, just a major underlying force for what, what happens to all of us. And, and um, I have to say that, you know, the other thing I found for Dr. Kelly was that he, uh, he has a list of, of honors that are too numerous to mention, and his list of publications is as long as my arm, perhaps a little bit longer than that. Um, but the real reason that we invited Dr. Kelly here this evening is that Iris Simon and I attended the meeting of the French and Bay Partners over at MDI Bio Lab, and he was the annual meeting speaker over there. And we were just blown away by how interesting his presentation was, and we both nodded at each other and just kind of went like this, and. We invited him, and it's our great honor to have uh, Dr. Joe Kelly as, as our uh, speaker tonight. Dr. Kelly. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I guess. I, I lecture to uh, a couple hundred students uh, every day at the University of Maine in the spring, and uh, I've never had a microphone. I mean, I, I've never had any need. I don't feel a need. So if I, I, I'm afraid I'll get carried away at some point and just start talking loud. So just, you know, calm me down if, if that should happen. Um, very honored to be here. Uh, I love this area, and I always uh, have. Uh, um, if you look at the, the map up there, um, you can see we're oh, in the Gulf of Maine, most of the way up to the north. I'll say at the beginning of this, when I was asked to talk on, you know, Frenchman Bay, I decided I would try to make that my focal point, and I, and I have. But I will say that it probably represents about 1% of all the, the work I've, I've done in this region, in good part because if you know Maine and if you've lived in Maine, and I was born and raised in Maine, all the research money, everything goes to southern Maine. Uh, the beaches, the beaches. I, uh, you know, I won't go into it, but I, there, there's hope that we may be able to get a NOAA research facility up in the northern part of this coast in the next few years, and it would be a, a real boom, because these, these estuaries to the north uh, are really, rel I mean, uh, given the United States, these are unstudied estuaries. And I'll, I'll show you some things that I've observed just in, in some of the work I've done here that uh, uh, has been pretty mind-boggling. Mind There's three elements to uh, our coastline, and I've only briefly talked about this one, and that's the rocks. Uh, the rocks are the skeleton, they're the framework of our coast, glacial deposits lie on top of them, those are the materials that form our soils, and when eroded by modern processes, the third thing, they, they become our beaches, our mud flats, our, our everything. So we're not like areas to the south of New York. We've been glaciated, and it's had a tremendous consequence. Our rocks are visible, and no more visible uh, than here, probably. This is a geological map of Maine, and on a geological map, the colors represent ages, and I'm not going to go into this at all. I teach a course called The Geology of Maine, but I'll, I'll note simply that the bluish colors that you see that make up Mount Desert Island and the Scudic Peninsula are granites, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, surrounding them, to, to some degree, in part, there are some of the earlier uh, rocks that uh, were associated with them. If I can use this pointer here. Over here in the Cranberry Island, you see some of these are volcanic rocks, and over here by Castine or volcanics. Each granite body uh, was the source of a volcano, a giant volcano. 
there were lots of volcanoes here. If you went about five miles beneath the surface of Yellowstone National Park, Yellowstone was a volcano, it blew its top off quite some time ago, but you would find granite like this forming today much as these granites did. Most of our uh, volcanic rocks are long gone. We've eroded down about five miles since, since these rocks were, were forming. But the land is still active, and that's what I, I put on here. This uh, uh, photograph that I took uh, over here, which many of you may have seen, the Champlain Mountain rock slide, there's still activities going on. The rocks are not dead. This was an illustration I used for a research proposal, which would have actually brought me into Frenchman Bay, but it wasn't funded. But it was a great proposal, and you know, if a great proposal, it will be someday. What you see here are the location of rather, some rather unprecedented earthquakes. This is not, a, this is not California. We don't have continental plates crashing together, and it's just not like that. Um, we're in a quiet, the middle of a plate that begins in Iceland in the mid-ocean ridge, and we're moving away from Europe. And the other side of our plate uh, is, is, uh, is Alaska, is, is the Pacific Ocean. So we're not in an area where we expect earthquakes, but these, these were fairly large earthquakes for our region and actually caused those, uh, that, that landslide and, and, and a couple of other sorts of features. One I'll talk about out in Frenchman Bay and just as I get a little bit farther into this, but you know, why do we have earthquakes? Primarily, uh, it, it's believed that the, the force that's moving our, you know, separating us from Europe uh, is itself not strong enough to cause earthquakes in this area, but for some reason, probably the, the, the granite bodies, it's focused on areas that had faults a long time ago and reactivated some of those. So no doubt there is a fault down the middle of Frenchman Bay, and it has been reactivated. I don't expect we'll ever see really large earthquakes, but the largest earthquakes in the United States were not in California, New Madrid, Missouri, and Charleston, South Carolina. So. One never knows. Far more important to us living here today, really, uh, are the effects of the Ice Age. This was a photograph I took a number of years ago when I had a, a great contract to work in the Glacier Bay National Park. Uh, kind of reminded me of uh, Mount Desert Island, Cadillac Mountain in the background, and Tidewater Glaciers, because when the glaciers left this area, just as they are now leaving Glacier Bay, they were tidewater, they were floating. Uh, at high tide, they went up. And often they calved off, and this is a really popular spot because these, these things just constantly fall into the sea. Uh, and they did that in, in our area as well. And, and in doing so, they promoted the melting of the ice. They kept causing more ice to move forward. Glaciers constantly move forward. They always move forward under their own weight. Uh, and in this particular instance here, they meet a point where they melt. And if, if that rate of moving forward equals the rate of melting, then they pause for a period of time. And, uh, this one had paused for a little bit, and, and, and as they move forward, they bring material at their base, and they leave some of that material where they pause. So I can't show you what's beneath uh, Lamplu Glacier, but just a little ways off at Mir Glacier, you can see what's called a moraine, that large pile of dirt. That is equivalent to what uh, is today under Lamplu and what underlies much of our coastline. These are areas, again, where the glacier brought that material, forward and it just kept melting at the same rate at the same place for oh, not a long time, maybe only 10, 15 years, but enough to make a, a large mountain. The Mir Glacier has regrettably continued to, migrate, or to melt away and is, is largely gone today. So we've got moraines, and I, and I point that out because that's central to our coastline. That dotted line that I show there is the, more or less the orientation of the ice as it melted back along the main coast meaning it formed moraines, big ridges of sand and mud and boulders, not continuously along there, but discontinuously along there. The important point of that is it, it blocks the bays. You know, it blocks them off. And when sea level was lower, and I'll get into that, those would have all been lakes. So there would have been substantial lakes. Frenchman Bay was no question a, a lake at some point in the past. Most of our contemporary lakes you see here in blue were, are, are, are held, they're held in place by glacial deposits. And now and then, you know, eventually they get worn through and they, they drain, they become wetlands. Um, you can see in the top image there, that's in Machias Bay. That's just one of the moraines. It's one of the larger ones that's, that's left coming across from the Cutler area uh, across the outer part of Machias Bay. But, it, but when it was fully developed and not eroded, you can see the large gravel beach on the one side that formed from it. Um, it would have probably made a lake in, in the Machias Bay area as well. 
This is a LIDAR image just looking. I, I, I couldn't find one of, of this area, though it's, that it, it exists. It's been, it's been made. It's not been processed. LIDAR is when you fly in, a, in, a, in an airplane and you send a, a laser beam down, lots of laser beams down. They, some of the beams reflect off the surfaces of the trees, and others go through and reflect back on the ground surface. We know the speed that light travels, and we know exactly in three dimensions where the airplane is. And as a result, we can measure the elevation of the land. This probably represents truly hundreds of millions of surveying observations. It would, we couldn't even make a map like this today. But you can see the moraines, those linear ridges that uh, abound through, through this area. Um, all, each one probably represents where the ice paused for a year or two or five years. You can see some of them still uh, appear to uh, block some of our, uh, our, uh, our bodies of water here. Um, some are used for the railroad line, partly on Route 1. And so it is around, around this area as well. These, these glacial deposits that were formed parallel to the coast as the ice melted uh, are central to um, providing an architecture to our landscape. There's just some pictures of some from the ground. This is in the Brooksville area. I was flying over it once, and I decided I would go back and take a picture. And that's what they look like, but you won't see most of them. Most of them are in the woods there, and you really can't see them. Geologists have never mapped these until those LIDAR images came out. And when they came out, people were stunned. They did to mapping geological surface features what aerial photos did. It was that large of a transformation. I should say all of that LIDAR imagery is available uh, from the state for free. Uh, so just to continue that, this is Mount Desert Island, and you can see um, the brown areas there, or where I, I actually put red arrows to point at them. Those are moraines. Those are areas where the glacier coming down Jordan Pond, Somme Sound, I think that's Echo Lake and Long Lake or Long Pond, uh, paused for a while and left. You can see the Jordan Pond uh, moraine right there out in front of the Jordan Pond house. Uh, so today, those are holding back those lakes. You don't see one at Somme Sound uh, because it's not there. It's already eroded. If you look at it, it's at the point called the Narrows up there across the top and another one right in the foreground there. Those were glacial moraines. And Somme Sound was no, no doubt a lake, that there are major archaeological sites in the region. People like to be where lakes met the ocean. There were waterfalls. Salmon probably pulled up. Just a great place to live. It's a great place to live now. Uh, so moraines give us a lot of the framework of our landscape by, by imponding water and creating our lakes, uh, orienting uh, many of our rivers. Sea level, though, the glaciers did other things. They weighed a great deal. For every um, three feet of ice, and the ice was more than a mile thick, for every three feet of ice, the crust of the earth is pushed down one foot. So it's we're like a waterbed, a, a grand global waterbed. but. Um, the ice was a mile thick, so the, the land in Maine was pushed down substantially. At the peak of the Ice Age, world ocean level was 120 meters lower than present because the, the water evaporated from the ocean to form the glaciers. Despite that, when the glacier was melting back from Maine, the water was much higher than present sea level. This is, uh, on, on the right here, is a friend of mine from Boston University standing in front of a, a sea stack. And that was once an arch and previously a cave in Monument Cove. Now it's just a freestanding stack of bedrock. But you can climb up on uh, Day Mountain, and you can see uh, that other sea stack there. It's often called Shaler's Rock to some geologists. Um, and it represents the highest stand of sea level in this area, about 200 feet above present, just as the ice was melting. So there would have been glaciers floating. There would have been icebergs all through the water. Um, when that was first recognized in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the 1870s, uh, it was astounding to people. Uh, a man named Nathan Shaler uh, came and, and, and discovered this. He mapped this area, and he gave a talk in Bar Harbor, and he, uh, you know, he, he had an illustration drawn of this. In fact, it's in a book that he, that he wrote. And, uh, and he talked about the last storm of the year, teetering that boulder on the top, and then the ocean level fell because the land rose, and there it was. And, there were some bad people in the audience who went out after that. And um, I grew up in Maine, you know. Some of the old boys wanted to have a drink, maybe. And they went up and they pushed the rock off the top. Well, Rockefeller built a path up to it. And he brought a, a crane up. And he had it put back. 
And I don't know why, but to this day, the Park Service doesn't mention Shaler's Rock. This is a magnificent area. All along here is what it would look like if you could walk beneath uh, Scudic Point or Otter Cove. It's a sea cliff. It's a former sea cliff without any ocean now. There's caves, and, but there's no sign of it. It's like we don't want any more of those things happening. Uh, Hull's Cove, uh, I actually never showed a picture of this before, right? This was one of Shaler's drawings showing a beach uh, that happened at a, a little bit later than that as sea level fell. There's a house there today or a farm, um, but you see it as you come in uh, on the road into, uh, in toward the National Park. So if you look at a map of our area, in the right-hand side, all that orange sort of a color uh, is areas that were covered by the ocean as a consequence of the land being pushed down. Uh, all the way up around into the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, all the way down. In fact, the Champlain, Lake Champlain was a, the Champlain Sea. And back in the 18, I think it was the 1820s, a farmer in Vermont was plowing his field next to the Sh Sh Lake Champlain, which was once as a sea, was quite a bit larger. And he hit some bones. And as he excavated them and dug them up, it was a whale bone. It is now the state fossil of Vermont, which is odd because it's not a, an ocean state. They didn't know really what it was doing there then, but uh, they thought it was important. On the left side, you see a map a student of mine made a number of years ago just detailing what our coastline would have looked like, oh, perhaps 12,000 years ago, probably actually before that now. We, we got better dates. But it changed constantly. The land after the ice left was li uplifting probably an inch or more per year. So in an average person's lifetime, they would see the coastline change profoundly, far more than than, than we do today. Accompanying the, um, accompanying the uh, deglaciation and the formation of moraines was glacial marine mud, this, this brown material here that you see from Glacier Bay. Glaciers grind things up, and they generate an enormous amount of mud. Virtually, I'd say 90% of what the glaciers left behind was really mud deposits. Uh, and that mud is pouring out of a tunnel in the ice uh, in Glacier Bay. And you can see some of those glacial marine mud deposits here in Brunswick, Maine, in Jonesport, Maine. Uh, they're throughout our region. And, and they're actually prone to landslide, which is why I took that. The person called me up that morning and lost 10% of his property and wondered what was going on. And I actually asked him, I said, you know, he was a retired science teacher. He was a principal of a high school in Maryland. What'd you think when you bought that property? He said, well, it's a great view. OK, it's a great view. But, but, but did you think it was unstable? That's clay, and it's vertical with no vegetation. And look at these bumps. Those are old landslide deposits. He goes, well, we thought we were on the rock-bound coast of Maine. There's no rock in the field of view. But he, so I say that if you live on a, on a, on a soft material, be, be alert. It, it, it doesn't uh, stay as permanently as rocks. Just a picture of a former wonderful graduate student, uh, Kristen Lee. Uh, we do a lot of work. I do a lot of work offshore and underwater. This is on a, a rainy day like we've had the last couple of days, pouring rain, but we're in the dry lab with the geophysical equipment. One device we're towing looks through the layers of mud offshore. The other device, not seen here, it's down below the water, actually images the bottom and makes soundings as to how deep it is. This is an area, I, I, I'm going to try to focus on this area. This was a project I had here in, in the Bass Harbor area over on the southwestern side of the island. And you can see kind of what the, the bottom looked like. It wasn't much to see those two colored blocks. But some of these artifacts, these archaeological artifacts, came from those areas, particularly that nice one in the upper right. It's a beautiful piece. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's over almost a foot in, in long, really, really sharp still, which struck me that this wasn't tumbling around. These were brought up by scallop draggers. Um, and who knows how many things they may have brought up and not noticed um, or don't tell people about. But, this particular one, these came from Paladin Shoal in here. It's a sheltered area near Bass Harbor. It's got those large islands sheltering the area from offshore waves, exposed to waves only from the northwest. Um, long story as to how we get into it, but we made a, a this is called multi-beam bathymetric imagery. We have a device that will go out, and it's sort of like the LIDAR does, except that we're in the water and we use sound, and it will, our device is a little bit less expensive. We, we do about 400 bathymetric soundings a second as we go over the bottom. And you mow the lawn. You can see where we would begin each line, going one way, coming back, and overlapping so that we cover it. And what you see here are two 
well, the, these ridges up here are glacial deposits. The waves came in from the upper left. You can see kind of the, those bumps, the boulders on it, and threw sand across the top to form little beaches. There are shorelines representing the sort of like bathtub rings. These are the shorelines as, as sea level actually rose against this area, causing some erosion probably, and the glacial deposits that are here eroded to produce beaches that are there. And at that time, it would have been an inlet stream, probably a waterfall coming down from Bass Harbor, and, a, and an inlet there. And that's a natural draw for people, just a great place. Uh, you probably had a lake for a while, and then it became an estuary, and then uh, it became open ocean. So we went out and we decided to collect some cores because we wanted to see if we could find anything that we could radiocarbon date. The way we do it is we have a, a, a vibrating thing. That's a pipe. It's six meters long. And on the top is something that vibrates. And if you were to touch it, vibrating, it would shake the very bones out of your body. But all we do is lower that. When that hits the bottom, we turn it on, and it just sinks right in. Uh, there's a ball valve that holds it on the bottom. We pick it up, and we've got a six meter long record of what the geology has been like. There's a picture of the kind of things we look for. Uh, that's a Maya arenaria, the soft shell clam. But it's in life position, and it's articulated. The two shells are together. It, it died where you see it. It lives near mean low water. So a radiocarbon date on that tells me, aha, mean low water was at about this depth at some point in the past. This was actually in Somestown. It was just a beautiful day there. Um, but over in Bass Harbor, this is just one of the cores. You can see uh, one and a half meters, two, it's almost three meters long. Sandy at the top, yellow is sandy at the bottom, and muddy gray in the middle there. And lots of things to date. We hit a veritable oyster reef on the bottom. There aren't any oysters, of course, in this area, but global cooling uh, drove them out about six, five, six, 6,000 years ago. But a series of radiocarbon dates uh, nine to 8,000 years ago. It was sandy, and then one of those beaches grew out and kind of protected the area. It became the mud you see down below here, full of plant fragments. Um, it got sandier toward the top and then was covered by gravel as the, as the ocean finally covered this area. Uh, in fact, we radiocarbon dated everything we could. Even the, the plants, I said plant fragments, you can see them in the upper left, they were still green. It was a plant called Zostra marina, eelgrass, uh, and it lives commonly in our estuaries today, but buried right where it fell over uh, as though it had, it had died just the year before. Very fragile though, and it would disintegrate at virtually no time. So we were able to look at this and establish, really, this is where sea level was here. And in doing that work in many places, uh, my colleague Dan Belknap and I and our students developed this curve. What you see here is calendar years, and they are truly calendar years before present. Here's today, going into the distant past, thousands of years ago, meters above and below sea level. Zero is, of course, where sea level is today. And so that's where we are today. But as we go farther back in time, uh, you can see we have a rather complicated sea level history. Now, if we were looking at Florida's, we would look at a history of sea level simply rising as the glaciers melted toward the present. But our area is different because, again, we had the weight of that ice pushing down, and then and it came back up. So we begin, our record begins up there in the upper left, about 70 meters or so uh, inland, at least, uh, above present sea level, where we have deltas. Uh, up at Pinio Ridge in, in the Cherry Field area, Columbia Falls. They're all across the state, and they mark the highest stand of the ocean against our land. Sea level fell really rapidly, though, once the ice left. And you know, world sea level was still rising, but the land was rising, just as in Sweden and Finland and Hudson Bay, parts of Newfoundland. The land is today still rising out of the ocean as a result of the glaciers only having disappeared a short time ago. Um, so we reached a point we call the low stand here about 12,500 years before present uh, at about 600, uh, 60 meters rather or, six, or 200 feet below present. That's a time when the rising land equaled the rate of the rising sea level and it paused for a while. There are deltas and beaches and all manner of coastal things to be found at that depth across our state. If you go farther to the south, it's a bit shallower. If you go up into Canada, it's actually a very different story. They had a very different timing of their ice age. So rapid sea level rise ensued after the low stand. And then this slow thing, we don't really know why. And it's, 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 when a scientist doesn't know why, it's, it's a research proposal. It's a research grant. And that will be one 
with a certainty. It's just, it's a, it's a great talk. Those colored things are the dates from uh, Bass Harbor. We'd had other dates in that area before, and then rising rapidly, and then slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, right to the present. I wasn't going to go into contemporary climate change so much other than to say that the rate of sea level rise over the last couple of thousand years has been, doesn't seem like much, two millimeters a year, but um, I, I'm sorry, I should take that back. That's what it is today on a tide gauge. It was 0.2 millimeters per year. So we're really seeing an uptick in the rate of sea level rise, close to that rapid rise we saw in a few of those places over there. So what else in this area? What's going on in modern things? So we, we've had a glaciation, sea level changes. Well, sea level's still rising. Um, Sand Beach always intrigued me. I always wanted to work there, and I've had several students work in the area. One fellow wanted to work offshore, and one of the only grants I actually got to work in the bay, we, we did some work here, and his thesis was to decide, where'd Sand Beach? Where'd that, all that shelly sand come from? And you know, if you know if you go there, it's, it varies between about 75 and 45 percent shell material. Very unusual. In this area, shells dissolve in the water. The water's cold, it holds a lot of carbon dioxide, that means a lot of carbonic acid. Shells don't live. If you want to see a lot of shells, you go south of Cape Hatteras, where there's, it's warmer water and shells, that's why shells are so abundant there. But here we have a beach, and there are several in this area like this, so <clears throat> one thought was, well, maybe this is something offshore, we should look. So that, back, that white rectangle there is an image, and it's an image of the bottom. What you see is this black line through the center is the, is the track line where we towed the device across the bottom. It sent sound out uh, under the device. 150 meters to either side, so it's three football fields from top to bottom and about six long, and it reflects back and records it. Where it's light, it was muddy. Where it's grayish, it was sandy. Where it's hard, you can see boulders, those little white and black shadow things, it was bedrock. Um, and over in this area, I, I can't see it, I'm too close, but I know it's here, there were ripples. It was just endless rippled bottom, probably ripples about, oh, I don't know, a foot and a half high. Um, and we thought, ah, oh, well, there's the source. It's ripples, the waves are driving, you know, whatever that is landward. So we collected a core, we drilled a core in it, and we collected a bottom sample. And that's the core, that's the glacial marine mud at the bottom, and then there's shelly sand, very much like the beach uh, below it. Um, and when we collected a bottom sample, that was the bottom sample from there. And it's the, the same proportions as we'd find, of shells we'd find on, on Sand Beach. Uh, uh, barnacles, uh, mussels, and uh, sea urchin spines dominating what you see. Um, so there is an offshore source, so Sand Beach is probably always going to have an offshore source. It's, in fact, every year, unlike many beaches, it gets more shell material that's available to add to it. It's in you know, rather good shape as a consequence. I'd hope to take this as a springboard to the Park Service and say, acid rain is melting this beach, it's dissolving it, and you really better do a study here, but the results led us a different direction. So, so the beach is fine. This is uh, the student's work. I should say Walter Barnhart was his name. He's the director of uh, the U.S. Geological Survey's Marine Geology Program today at Woods Hole. And uh, this was just some of the areas we mapped in some detail, but the yellow areas in there were all shelly sand that we were able to measure. And this is an atlas we produced for the whole coast of Maine, but just showing the, the nature of our, our observations in this area. So we found several areas. Those areas that are toward a little bit offshore are all highly enriched in calcium carbonate or seashells. You know, off Sand Beach, an interesting one off Otter Cove, suggesting that there once had been a shell beach way out there, not, the, not where the road crosses today. That, that's a glacial moraine, actually, that the beach is founded on in the road. But more seaward, there was a high concentration of shells. Similarly, off to the, to the left, to the west a little bit, probably that's a little Hunter Beach. And then around the Cranberry Islands, there are a lot of shells. So an interesting area where there really isn't a lot of other material available, and there's a lot of biological productivity that has been focused into these little bays to give us our shelly beaches. Sea erosion is happening, and I give a whole hour-long lecture on, on this. This is the beginning slide in, in, in my Beaches and Coast course. But um, schooner, schooner over, Overlook, I'll always call it Anemone Cave, because it was always called Anemone Cave when I've been there a billion times. And, to discourage people from, well, I was there once and I watched a, a, a Japanese, a busload of Japanese tourists get off and run out to get the first picture of the anemone in the pools and slide and go right in there and clean out the entire tidal pool of anemones. So 
it's discouraged from a, a telling people that it's there. But there's obviously a beautiful cave there, wonderful pools, similarly, out on Ironbound Island. And these rocks are eroding. They're actively eroding today, marking the, <coughs> the, uh, the present-day shoreline. Not what you'd expect, and this was some of Walter Barnhart's and my work. This is Frenchman Bay, and what we mapped on this is natural gas. You can see it as that amber sort of a color, and you see it over here uh, on the right where uh, BR represents bedrock, uh, and we knew we were coming off. It's that circled area right, right, right in there, the black circle. We were coming off. There's a lighthouse out there in the bay. Uh, the bedrock descends, but then it disappears under that NG. And above it is glacial marine, the GM, and it continues across. It's most of what represents the bay, and it disappears under the NG. The NG is natural gas. It's methane. Um, same thing you'd burn in your house. We've collected cores on it. You can light them, and they, they flame. Not enough to ever produce as a natural gas deposit, but interesting. Here you see it was doming the bottom. It's kind of pressuring and pushing up. So I go back to that proposal I wrote about the bedrock. When those earthquakes happened, I thought, Ha, ah, maybe it released that gas, and I can go off and find a crater or something there. Um, I don't think the, the, the reviewers really, they were all from California, and I don't think they, well, it's easy to say that, I don't think. But it's there, and there's a lot of gas. If you, you step back and look at the main coast, these are features that I've mapped before, and we published this paper. All the green things are natural gas fields. There are many, many smaller ones. No work done at all. Don't think there aren't any down east. I, I just, it's hard to get money to work there. And there's none down in Sockle Bay and Wells where it's sandy beaches because it, the gas would bubble through the sand and it wouldn't be there. You need muddy bays to, to preserve that. Um, I'll show you three things, though. And three of these, not all of them, but many of these bays have what we call pockmarks, where the gas has escaped violently. Um, uh, this is uh, Belfast Bay over here, and that's Blue Hill Bay right over there. And you notice all those little holes, those, those, I said little, they are not little, they are gigantic. This room wouldn't even be mappable at that scale. Uh, the largest one is uh, 350 meters in diameter, it's round, and 38 meters deep. This is the size of the Rose Bowl with the stands. So you could put this building in the smallest one you can see there. There are 2,100 of them mapped in Belfast Bay. I've never counted uh, Blue Hill. They're all over our place. Um, this is just an orient, just tilt the Belfast Bay one with a, down where the white arrow is, and that's what it looks like. The bay bottom has been unbelievable. So I thought, earthquakes, earthquakes. Maybe there have been large earthquakes, and maybe these things are telling us these are sites of major earthquakes in the past. Uh, good ideas get funded, you know, and it, even if I don't live to fund it, somebody will read that paper. That's the good thing about science. Someone will read that someday and go, let's go see if it's changed. These are, these are highly precisely mapped, uh, and you could go out tomorrow, and if it changed, you, you, could, you could discern that. Uh, Somme Sound, I had to show that. Yeah, Somme Sound also has them. You can see the holes up in there. They're all through it. Um, again, it was a lake, so I began thinking, well, why do we have them here? There are none of these pockmarks in Chesapeake Bay or Delaware Bay or Galveston or San Francisco. Where do you see them? Well, there's some in Narragansett Sound, here, all through Maine, Nova Scotia, the Canadian Maritimes. I work in Ireland and Scotland a lot. They're through there. One thing they all have in common is they were glaciated. Well, what's that got to do with it? Well, I guess I really don't know. Uh, other than glaciers alter the landscape and make lakes, and lakes trap organic matter. And so this was my cartoon model for how those uh, formed. Uh, in the upper left there, you see there's the glacier, and then there, there's the ocean coming in with icebergs, and the glacial marine mud in blue, and then sea level falls, uh, and we get lakes forming in these basins that existed. And because it's muddy, the, the, the lake doesn't drain down. It stays there, and that black would be organic matter beginning to collect in the lakes. Uh, and then the ocean comes back. It covers it with mud. Now all that organic matter is buried in modern mud, and bacteria break organic matter down to make methane. And so that's my cartoon model for how these have formed. Uh, I have spent three, three masters and two PhD theses trying to, but, but it's been hard. We have not been able to succeed. What I want to do is drill a core down in one of these and get to the bottom and say, aha, lake mud. It's farther down, I could show a lot of slides on it, but it's farther down than you think. We've not been able to get there. But we can see some examples, and I'll, I'll end with this, how these how this forms. 
this is the road, the lower picture here is the road coming in. That's the, uh, what's it called, the ocean, Oceanarium, coming in uh, just past Thompson Island, coming toward Bar Harbor. If you stand on that road at the culvert and look out, that's what you see. This is a freshwater bog. It's called an ombrotrophic bog. It gets everything it needs, water, uh, nutrients, everything through rainfall or snowfall. There's no river, nothing comes into it. Maine is really well known. We have lots of these. Uh, this one, what struck me, and it just, it just, I just went crazy when I, when I first recognized what I was seeing, is that this is a freshwater bog, and that, that's a salt marsh. That's salt water and fresh water, and they meet just like that. That's unstable. That can't be. And, the, and not only that, the freshwater bog goes up. It goes up uh, well, three meters, say, almost 10 feet. So it's sticking up as a big dome, uh, and here's the salt water. In fact, I have a device that actually lets us look through things like this. It's radar. We send radar into the ground. The salt water goes way under here, almost as far as those spruce trees. But the things that live on the surface don't care about that. The sphagnum moss does, doesn't care. It doesn't have any influence on it. It's, it's on top. And, and so I had a student just finish her master's thesis. and We measured the rate of change of the boundary between the salt marsh and the freshwater bog. And it was not measurable. I thought it would have been 20 feet a year. No, not even measurable. So there's enough fresh water pouring out of that bog to hold the ocean at bay. But it's got to change some days. There's, we did this study in a lot of other places, and they were all, all the same. And I, I've got to believe that a large storm someday will come, throw salt water high enough and far enough inland onto that fresh water bog, and it, will, it won't just move uh, you know, a few inches a year, it'll move 30 feet. The first time it's moved 30 feet in 50 years, but that has to be how it evolves. But in doing so, it's going to leave some organic matter at the bottom, and the, and the ocean will have come in and covered a lot of organic matter that bacteria could turn into methane. So to my last uh, image that Tom liked, I, uh, so our, our coastline is dynamic. All of the, everything you see along it is changing. You know, and Taunton Bay here, and this is the, the reversing falls um, uh, at the entrance to Taunton Bay. Uh, you see in the upper right there that elongate peninsula coming up. Well, that's a glacial moraine, and there's so many of them. They're all that orientation. And that was, Taunton Bay was, was Lake Taunton um, until it broke through there. Um, and it probably didn't break through instantly. It probably broke through slowly with some rapids that got worse as the stream came down. Maybe the ocean working at the other side. Certainly, there were Native Americans in the area that took advantage of living in a great spot like this. You had a lake on the one hand, the ocean run, running salmon, probably. Um, but eventually, the ocean did break through, and Taunton Bay became uh, what it is today, which is, uh, is marine. Um, and this, the, uh, virtually every bay in Maine, I, I, this is just a great example. It's probably the most recent example. And I say recent, I don't know when. Um, if I had to guess, and I've been asked to guess before. I love guessing because I'm guessing. Uh, I'd say something like two, three, four, five thousand years ago. It wasn't yesterday, um, but that's pretty recent. Uh, the others have 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 evolved um, uh, since before that time. Um, and you can go back farther out in this bay and in other bays, and you can see other areas where there would have been smaller lakes. And one by one, they've all become marine bays. All of our bays are just the present bay. They all have lakes behind them that will become the next bays, and they all have parts of the ocean and bays, seaward of them, that were yesterday's lakes. So I'll finish with that. This is a great geological location, and, and I thank you very much for, for inviting me. <laughs> questions? So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about you know, anything. Now, I say this to classes all the time, and I, I'll call on somebody if they don't ask the question. <laughs> I will call. You, you don't have to ask the question. Um, what was the... Uh, can you hold on a second so we can... Oh, the microphone. We have to get you a microphone. Don't be shy about the microphone now. It's okay. Nobody... I'll try not to. Uh, what was the historical earthquake that I saw as a square... Thing. Yeah, those older ones. An older one. Okay. What, what year was that? And it looks like it was located on the, uh, um, uh, just to the east of us here. Uh, it was. There's two of them on there, actually. There's one 
over by uh, uh, the entrance to, there we go, to Somme Sound. Uh, you can see 1847 and, actually it's not that old, 1995. 1995 would have been instrumented, so that would have been known by instrumentation. The 1847 would have been in a newspaper. Uh, a number of years ago, um, what actually uh, funded the construction of that map was an effort by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to site a high-level radioactive waste site. Every state had to volunteer a uh, a, a deposit, and Maine said, well, granite, I suppose, would be, but we didn't want it. Um, in fact, I was hired specifically to help prevent that from happening. <laughs> so one thing I did is I contracted with a historian, a famous historian at the University of Maine, David Smith, who did a survey of all the newspaper reports he could find in Maine. He had a student do her master's thesis on it, and came up with the dates, approximate magnitudes. We didn't have devices then, but you know, there's a scale, Mercalli scale, if the chimney <coughs> fell over, you can estimate the kind of force involved to require that. And so there's, an inv there's a database of where all the historic uh, earthquakes were in the state. Many of them occur in clusters, not here, not like, like that cluster, but uh, uh, Eastport, Maine has a lot of clusters, Bath, Maine has some. Um, so we have a pretty good idea of where they were for the last, you know, couple of hundred years. That's not very long, though. The magnitude of the one? I could easily look it up. It, it, there's a database with all of that information. Um, Maine Geological Survey, and you type in earthquake history, and it'll just jump right out. Sure. I can probably speak loud enough. Oh, I'm sure you can. But there was an uh, application on the internet that just has gone down over the past year and hasn't been back up, but it was one in which it linked into these national databases of the earthquakes, and you could see in real time a rotating sphere of the earth with bing, bing, bing all over. Oh, that's pretty cool. Following, you know, the, the around Japan and that whole yeah. area, and it was fascinating to watch just even locally. Right. Um, and that... Uh, the, the publication of that data and so forth has not been linked into something that is running now. So the person that wrote that up, there, there must be other ones that do it. I saw that one. The database is a, is a global thing. I mean, the whole world keeps these records and they're available in many places. But somebody had this great idea to turn the animation and, 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 and probably was a graduate student who graduated and moved on and they turned it off. But it would, would be nice to see that, yeah. Over in the far side there. <clears throat> so Sullivan Harbor, which is the body of water south of the Reversing Falls, Correct. must have been a lake at one time, and oh, Bean sure. Island at the south end of Sullivan Harbor kind of clogged it up and was, must have been a glacial moraine. That, that it, it could be bedrock, too. There's, you know, there's rocks in the area, yeah, too. Sure. I'm not sure. I don't know that particular it, area. It's right at the north end of Frenchman and the Bay, upper going okay. up toward Reversing yep. Falls. Um, Almost certainly, and I'd say almost certainly Frenchman Bay itself. I mean, you don't see any, any uh, really good moraines around Mount Desert Island. There's nothing I've seen on the side. Um, but not to say that they aren't out here. There are, we crossed them in a number of places when we, when we were working out there. Um, enough so that, you know, again, sea level would, would have been low enough, 200 feet, that it would have, the, the bay would have held no water. Anyways, it would have been land that was just drained by streams. Yeah, sure. But I believe there, there would certainly have been lakes in there. Sullivan Harbor is the body of water right that yeah. reversing falls empties into. Okay, then that almost with a certainty would have, would have held a lake. Or a pond, probably a pond, small pond. Could, yes. Could, could, could you comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Could, could you make comment on some of the eskers that are around in this area, particularly sure. Lemoyne esker? Uh, okay. Um, eskers, um, I didn't show any. Uh, eskers are ice tunnel deposits. It's Gaelic word. There are lots of eskers in, in Ireland. Um, and when, when the glaciers begin melting at the surface, uh, the water pools up, and, it, and it, you know, there are cracks in the ice where it goes over irregular ground and the water can drain down in Greenland, literally miles down, uh, 
and, and as it goes down, it melts its way and it forms a, you know, an integrated plumbing system. And as the glaciers move over the ground, they pick up rocks, mud, everything that's in their way. And you know, if, uh, so that, that, that eventually gets drawn into these esker deposits. And so the eskers tend to be you know, meandering through the ice and then maybe on the bottom of the ice and they begin drawing in. You got a hole, the ice moves toward it to fill it in. So it constantly brings debris to this esker and the water races out, leaves behind only gravel, boulders, <coughs> sand maybe, no mud, never any mud. The water's just moving too fast. Uh, and then as the ice melts back, uh, you're left with this, this, this ridge that snakes its way across the landscape. Now sometimes uh, along that trail of that esker, um, the slope might change, and, and, and it, you'll pause, and you'll, you'll not just have a, a narrow, elongate a ridge, but you can form a, it looks like a delta, but it's not a delta, because it's completely enclosed in ice when it forms, and you can get a kind of a, a, a larger deposit, formed by moving water with layers that are very, very definitely recognizable. Uh, many of those are actively quarried for sand and gravel deposits, and so we see them, the Moyne, um, I'm not sure, do they quarry that? Maybe they do. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it, long ago, people learned to see, oh, those things, those are sand and gravel ore deposits. Uh, yeah, many of them have been quarried. Many of them we used for roads originally, because they, they bring you up above the ground. If you're going through wetlands, you know, you're up above it, like the, the airline that, that, that takes people from Bangor down east. Uh, Maine has lots of eskers. There are none significantly offshore. There are none underwater, not one, and not that they weren't preserved when sea level rose, they weren't there. Sea le the eskers represent a time when the glacier is really rapidly melting from its top and its insides. And so until the glaciers got to Maine, to more or less the coast, they weren't doing that. Once they got here, just a little inland from here, the, the eskers really begin. There's one at the head of Penobscot Bay, there's one in the head part of uh, Casco Bay, and then they become much more abundant inland. And it's thought to represent stagnating ice, that the ice is just, it's losing it. And it probably represents the time when that, um, the Gulf of St. Lawrence melted through because the icebergs could calve off there uh, to the, uh, the Champlain Sea, and Maine became isolated from the main mass of ice from Canada. So we didn't have all that ice coming down from the north, and Maine's ice sheet just sank down and all but died out. In fact, it, it became isolated as a series of domes in Arusta County and in some of the mountainous areas. So the eskers are significant for they tell us the late stages that the ice was just melting and dying as it was disappearing. Yes. A few years ago, I went to a lecture at Eagle Hill, and this is what I think I remember, and that is that uh, the shore of Hancock County is actually sinking. Ah. And then, you know, we have the um, sea level rising, and pretty soon a lot of us are going to have shoreline property. Well, the latter part of that sentence is correct. Sea level is rising, and, and it is, uh, you know, a couple millimeters a year, which is nothing. It's less, that's less than half the rate in North Carolina, where the ground is still actively sinking. Um, we're not really sinking or rising. The land itself here is fairly stable. So that's, we're probably seeing world sea level rise, a couple millimeters per year. But the part you mentioned before was actually what brought me here originally, and was the the whole thing, we, we saw a clustering of earthquakes in uh, the Eastport area, lots of earthquakes, disproportionately large number. And there was a survey line uh, made back by, actually Jefferson Davis was the head of the Coast and Geodetic Survey from Bangor to, well, uh, Cherryfield to Pineo Ridge, a big blueberry barren up there, and then, then they use a, that would be a first order level network, where really, these are the best surveyed monuments, and then you'd survey out from those, and then out from other points. Well, it looked as though that that land from, from its earlier survey through later ones showed that down east Maine was sinking rapidly, I mean, as much as a meter per year. I uh, came into this project, it was a multi-million dollar project, and I saw this information, we ought to write this up, this is really something. I, uh, I accepted the, the surveyor, he was a surveying engineer's work, and, and other observations that had been made. It looked like it was eroding a lot, but that, that didn't mean too much. But the surveyor information was pretty hard. The earthquakes were clearly happening there. 
So I actually wrote the paper up in the most prominent journal in the Earth Sciences. And uh, it was pretty nice. I thought, well, that's pretty good. That was the first paper I wrote in Maine. And I didn't even want to be a co-author because I didn't generate any of it. I just wrote it. But a um, person from MIT called me up, oh, about two years later. So I just don't let things go. People think there's a climate conspiracy. Are you kidding? If you could show someone else is wrong, everybody wants to show someone else is wrong. <laughs> this guy, Nafi Toxas, called me up. I didn't know of him, but he turns out he's a very famous seismologist. He was fascinated by this, absolutely captivated and wanted, so he came and he visited with us and he saw the surveying engineer and he saw the records, he fully understood what he was looking at and he went away, he got a grant uh, and he hired a postdoc who came in and then called us up about two years later and said, you know, that's all wrong, there's a systematic survey error there, that, that's not correct. And this fellow had left the University of Maine <laughs> since then, so he wasn't around and I, and I I'm not a surveying engineer. We had another engineer look at it, and he goes, oh, yeah. And he said, not only that, there's two other lines that were done in between. That, that they did. What they did is they very often put uh, monuments to this surveying on boulders that w weren't bedrock. And they, they, so they'd move up and down. You could survey them in different times. I mean, they wouldn't do that today, but they did then. So the paper, I, I encouraged him. I said, you, you ought to write a comment. And um, I don't think we'll reply even. We did not reply. It, but there was a man who was really central to that project, uh, Hal Bournes, a good personal friend, but he hasn't let go of that. And if he gets a, a class of the uninitiated, he will still start to say that. It's, it's just not so. It is not so. Uh, and we've, we've done two, I had two PhD students, outstanding people, each have gone on to great university lives, look at sea level rise along our coastline, looking at just salt marshes. Salt marshes are right at mean high water today. We can go down to the bottom of them, and we can mark the record uh, of sea level rise. And I show some of those on my sea level curve, and it's the same rate of rise along the entire main coast for the last 5,000 years. And not one, but another student even came in later to do it even better, and there's not much you can say that it hasn't, it hasn't changed. So good memory, but uh, that, was, <laughs> that wasn't correct. Okay, thank you. Sure, yes. What, what is in the future? What do you see in the next five years being exposed to us as, you know, the edge of geology? Oh, the edge of geology. Um, well, I'll just follow all my writings. You'll really... <laughs> um, kind of thing, I mean, it takes money, you know, to do science. I mean, it takes real money. Uh, we just got a $20 million grant. It's a secret, but $20 million grant at the university. I mean, it's going to be a big deal. Um, that it's, it's in aquaculture, but my work is going to be to do multi-beam bathymetry, really detailed maps like that little area in five estuaries in Maine. And I don't know exactly which ones yet we're going to have a meeting. But that will be big locally because suddenly there'll be really nice charts. Uh, you'll see boulders, you know, everything on the bottom. Everything will be put online and made available. Um, now, will you, is the Scottish man, the man from Scotland, still in the aquaculture area? Yes, yes, Ian Bricknell, yeah. who actually has a degree in geology from the University of Edinburgh, so he's, he's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, not everyone can go to university in New England. No, 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 he, he's, they, they've got a great, um, it's a great project. He was central to writing it. I just, they asked me to be part of it and do this, this bathymetry, and I will. Um, in our area, I mean, we'll be looking at those gas things. Those are kind of fascinating. Um, how do they form? Are they earthquake related? That would be International, that would be the biggest journals in the world if we could show that, because they occur all over the world. Um, whether we can show that or not is, is hard to say. But geology. Find the source of what? Well, we want to find that it's that there's or there's lake sediment at the bottom um, or whatever is at the bottom. I don't really care. But the timing is critical. Did they all? Did they? Did something just shake the table all at once and they all formed at once? You know, we make little models. You can you can. Uh, take a plexiglass thing and put some mud and put a layer of sugar in it and bacteria like, like that. And they'll come in, you know, they'll ferment. And you put more mud on top and you can make little things like that. But if you shake it, all the gas comes up all at once. So we'd really be looking to see the timing. We just haven't found a good way to establish when they form. When you core next to them, we can't get to the bottom yet, but we will. But it's just uniform. There's no obvious, there's not, it's all just fine. Now is it holding there or is it constantly regenerating these? Oh, it's constantly regenerating the so gas. Could, yeah. Oh, it's bubbling out. Could you get fuel out of them? Or will it eventually 
run dry. No, because you wouldn't get enough. You'd start pumping it, and it would be dry before you even got your boat back. I mean, there's just not. When they produce gas from offshore, you're 20,000 feet down. It's pressured so that uh, you know, and uh, you know, an area has a huge volume of methane molecules. This isn't under any pressure. And these are all separate. They're not combined in any way around the needle. They're not connected at all. Well, I mean, that was one hypothesis we had. Could this be coming from the rocks? My, even though these granites don't give you methane, um, we thought well, maybe there's something out there. And, and the key to that is to look at the, uh, you know, if it was coming from, like there are there are these gas things in, in oil and gas fields. You'll get methane and ethane and propane and butane, all those alkanes. We get methane. So that just killed the thought that it was coming from petroleum. And good foundations from the granite. What's that? Good foundations from the granite. Yes. Yes. You should be able also to determine if it was coming up through the rocks by looking for something like radon. Um, I suppose we could. I mean, it's hard to get the samples for one thing, but when we looked at it and, and saw, we, we, you know, we got analyses when it was all ethane, all methane rather, that was, it was just pretty clear. Um, I could go into it, it would take a lot more to explain it, but there's, there's different forms of some of the elements of carbon, of oxygen and hydrogen, different isotopes that let us really decide, did it come from a lake, was it an estuarine organic matter? You really pinpoint it because they're all different in different places. I haven't done that yet either, and that would be, I have a new student coming this fall, and it might be what, something I try to work with her about. Interesting area, though, but that, don't know the answer, and I, I've given talks on it, and people like it because I don't know the answer. <laughs> how, uh, how fast do you think we should be raising our houses? <laughs> well, two millimeters a year. Two millimeters a year. <laughs> well, two and a half in your set. No, well, I mean, that's the problem, problem with that. I mean, you'll see, maybe you've even seen that. I, I, I give sea level talks all the time, but what are called passive drowning models. I could, I could take a geographic information system, a computer that knows all the elevations here, and say, all right, make the water level, you know, a, a meter higher, or some, some, and it will. It'll flood areas. But now on, on Mount Desert Island, you wouldn't even notice it because it's, it's too rocky and too steep. Sand Beach would appear drowned. But Sand Beach won't do that. It will move landward if it has to, or it'll just, it, it just won't do that. So the things that we're really interested in, the rocky areas, again, nobody lives within two million, you know, nobody's living on the water. Um, the sand beaches uh, are dynamic, and they're gonna change completely unpredictably. I mean, sand beach is pretty predictable. Old Orchard Beach is not. Um, salt marshes are probably at risk. They can probably take up to about seven or eight millimeters a year and they start to break up. I could go into a whole talk on it. Ours are already doing that. They're, they're starting to disappear. You'll see big pools of water opening up on them. Uh, and those soft bluffs of glacial marine clay, those, are, those that is the, the soft underbelly of our coast. It makes up 49% of the entire shoreline of the coast of Maine. And it's far more widespread. I, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I, I mean, Casco Bay, it's phenomenal. I mean, people will start to wall it up, but it's really hard to do that, to get, I mean, you know, it's, it's worth more than a very valuable property to really stop the erosion. And of course, in stopping the erosion, well, there's no more mud coming on the tidal flat now, and there's the downside of that. But uh, that's the biggest problem, and it isn't, you know, a passive drowning thing says, well, yeah, the bluff is as high as that wall, and it's, you know, it's not, but it doesn't work that way. It caves in, and the whole thing comes down. That's the big problem. And you get educated people buying really, really nice property, and not knowing that that's not the rock bottom coast of Maine. That's the soft underbelly of Maine. They ought to write a, they ought to write a Down East magazine. Or, so now they have houses on some of those. They wouldn't be published on them. <laughs> OK, well, thank you all very much. Everybody gets an A. I want to thank you for coming, Professor Cohen. Oh. It was fascinating. Your class never I gave me a lot. <laughs> oh, Lord. Thank you, you so much. You said you like to guess. Yeah. Would you guess? Oh, to guess? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Me. Yes. Thank you very I much. Thank all of you. Coming. Right. Thank you.